We would like to begin by acknowledging our Penobscot namesake. The Penobscots have inhabited Maine and surrounding areas for over 11,000 years. Their ancestral territory included many rivers that flow into the Gulf of Maine, including all the watersheds from the Machias River in the east to Cape Ann in Massachusetts. The Penobscot Nation is one of the oldest continuously operating governments in the world. The Penobscot Nation is part of the Wabanaki Confederacy, which also includes the Passamaquoddy, Micmac, and Maliseet. Please join us in expressing our deepest respect to Penobscot leaders, past, present, and emerging, and gratitude to the Penobscot community for their enduring care and protection of the lands and waterways. Hello, everybody. My name is Jen Shepard, and I am the executive director of Penobscot Theater Company located in Bangor, Maine. I am super excited to be here with you tonight. Um, you may or may not know, but we just debuted the final show of our main course subscription series entitled Je ne suis Je ne suis, nope, I am not Evangeline. I'm nervous, so my tongue isn't doing what I want. This is the final show, and I'm very excited about it. We commissioned Carolyn Cook, who is one of the founders of Teatro de Rev in Atlanta, Georgia, to write this play for us. It became a very personal play about a woman who is facing a loss of her home, and it is a loss that is both figurative and literal. It's a loss of a person and a loss of a place. Um, so when we started this play, I had a meeting with Audrey Thompson from Museum LA, which stands for Lewiston Auburn, not Los Angeles, we're in Maine people. And she mentioned to me that the French speaking community had been greatly, the Maine based French speaking community um, had been greatly uh, revitalized by the African diaspora, which is coming here to Maine. There have been um, influxes of people who speak many languages but they also speak French. Over 20 countries in Africa actually speak French as well as many other languages. So that got me thinking. We have to talk about that. That is the future of Maine. That is where we're headed. So I have a lot of guests with me tonight and I wanna just make this statement as well. As I mentioned, the play, I Am Not Evangeline is about a loss of home. This is not the only story about loss of home. There are many. It crosses cultural lines, country lines, all kinds of lines. So we do not mean to claim this space just for ourselves. We recognize all the stories. So today we are talking, as I mentioned, about folks who are of African descent who live here. And I'm joined by Ira Kramer, who is my associate at the Penobscot Theater, as well as an actor and a singer. Hi, Ira. Hello, so wonderful to be here in this evening of celebration. Yes, did I miss anything? Uh, no, you did not, you are right on the nose. Oh, good. Okay, good. First time for everything. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to get to the guests because that's what it's really all about tonight. So first of all, joining us all the way from Bangor, Maine, is Angela Okafor. She is an attorney and owner of an international market and hair care business called Tropical Taste, guest lecturer at Eastern Maine Community College, Bangor City Council person, recipient of the Trailblazer Award for Emp from Empower Immigrant Women, as well as the Girl Scouts of Maine Pearls of Wisdom in 2021 one and recipient of Maine Business 2020 Women to Watch and the Women's Fun Call to Action Award. Amazing. Hello, Angela. Welcome. Hi, Jen. Thank you for having me here. You're so welcome. I'm so glad you could join us. I loved you on Mr. Ben's Playhouse. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you. My kids could have stopped me. What? <laughs> well, it was awesome to have you on there as, uh, you know, basically the person, a person from our community who is helping our community. One of the helpers, as Mr. Rogers would say. Um, our second guest is one of the, he's a co-founder and publisher of Amjambo Africa. If you've not heard of Amjambo Africa, it's in its fourth year. It's based in Portland, Maine. It is a newspaper that is published in no less than six languages. It's published online and it is simply amazing to read it. It is a global center for communication based here in Maine. That gentleman is George Budago Makoko. He is also the author of Ladder to the Moon, founder of the Ladder to the Moon Network. And in 2018, along with a group of friends, he started Serenity Residential Care, which is a series of homes. Did I get that right, George? You got it right, Jen, thank you. 
You're so welcome. Thank you for being here. What a gift you gave us with founding Amjumbo Africa here in Portland. It's incredible. I'm so humbled to be with you tonight and I'm just looking forward to the conversation. Me too. I'm glad you could be here with us. Also joining us from Mid Coast, Maine, is a woman who is the French translator from Amjambo, Africa, among many other things. It is Natalie Gori. She's a French teacher at Mount Ararat in Topsom. Uh, she is the recent recipient of the Chevalier Knight in the Academic Order of the Palms and on the board of the uh, Alanzay Francaise du Maine. Natalie, how did I do? You did fine. <laughs> you did very well. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you here for joining me here tonight. I'm so glad that you could be with us. And congratulations on your recent honor. It's amazing. Thank you. It, it is an honor. Thank you. It was a surprise, I heard. It right? was. Yes. Yes. All right. I think I'm going to check in with Ira real quick about uh, snacks and drinks that we thought people might like to enjoy while they're listening to these fine folks talk. Absolutely. I, I think it's just a wonderful way for us to uh, to experience a culture, you know, and I think our, our own connection to our own culture, we, a lot of us have uh, these kind of visceral memories about, about when you eat a certain dish and it's taken you back to your childhood. So I think it's a wonderful and beautiful way to ex um, enter into experiencing another culture. So uh, I just dropped a link uh, to the event uh, in the chat there. So if you want to go ahead and click on that, you can find some links to some recipes for some tasty foods that you're seeing on the screen here. And uh, if you don't have time to make those right now, you can always make them later. Yes, Jen. exactly. Thanks, Ira. So welcome, Angela, George, and Natalie back to the screen. Hello, everyone. Hello, bonsoir. <laughs> bonsoir, bonsoir. bonsoir. Um, I guess let's start with, um, since we just mentioned food, I know before we went live, Ira, you kind of asked, what was it that you asked? Do you have any food memories? Is that what you said? Like, Yeah, I think that? kind of what I was talking about right there. Is there a particular memory uh, or a particular dish that makes you have a memory, something from maybe your childhood or that's very tied closely to culture, your own culture, your own family? Anyone can take that question. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> should I should I stop? Okay, so I have a couple of memories, um, what which are uh, basically going back to each side of my family, my mother and my father. So on my father's side, I'm from Normandy, and um, I remember I have memories of uh, vacations at my grandmother's house and of her making crepe which are the French, you know, the French pancakes. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. had, um, it was usually on Sunday night. It was like, because we had a big Sunday lunch meal, which is very typical in France. So Sunday night was more of a kind of a lighter, if you want, meal, which was a crepe night. So that's something that I, I grew up with. And um, I keep doing that myself, making crepe for my granddaughter. And then um, on, my, on my mother's side, did I say my, my father's side? I'm from Normandy. On my mother's side, my mother uh, was actually born and grew up in Morocco or Maroc. So she brought in um, when her parents moved to France, to the south of France, she brought in a lot of the um, Moroccan and Spanish culture also. And she always made amazing couscous. Mm. Couscous. And uh, not just a grain of couscous, but the whole meal, you know, with the meat, usually two or three different kinds of meat and the vegetables and the spices and the sauce. And, um, uh, and it's so good, it's just so like, you know, comfort food. <laughs> so couscous and crepe, voila. <laughs> oh, sounds very good. Angela or George, do you want to speak to that question? Yeah. <clears throat> so I saw you, you put up pepe puff puff. And I kind of smiled inside because that is a typical Nigerian um, snack. Um, growing up, you know, my mom, we would make them. And, you know, uh, as a parent, you make them and you kind of anticipate it's going to go for a couple of days or so. But most times before the morning, it's usually finished because, you know, we go and sneak and take. In uh, most of African countries, fufu 
is a very uh, staple food. So we would make the fufu and um, we would, you know, you eat it with our fingers, you dip it in a soup. We have different types of soup. So um, this reminds me every time, especially with my kids, because I have three minor children that are very super picky eaters. So, um, you know, my mom will make certain soup, like especially the one we call bitter lip soup. It is very healthy, but for whatever reason, I just didn't like it. So, you know, instead of dipping your fufu in the soup to get soup, my finger will be like, I'll be trying to get the, you know, the minimal touch of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom will be like, you know. Is she frozen? Oh, no. Because she knows I don't like it. You know, <laughs> about of what I saw. It was basically a way of telling me, you either eat this food or you will eat this food by four. You know? <laughs> so it reminds me always my childhood, especially when my kids are like, I don't want this, mama. I don't want that, but I want that. I want it this. You know, it's like, you guys have a choice. Now, growing up, I didn't have a choice. It was either I ate food or I went hungry. You yeah. know, so uh, it's something that sometimes when I remember it these days, I'm like, well, fun growing up. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> I identify with that with my parents. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> that's a great story. Likewise. George, any, any memories? Yeah, so for me, I like boiled potatoes. Mm -hmm. and, and I always like to boil them until they are about to burn at the bottom of the dish. And, uh -huh. and I like that, you know, blackish and, you know, smell and when it smells and it's so good and i don't put any oil in it nothing else just put them in peel them up put it into water let them cook until they must like last water is drowned and then it, i love that but I also, of course i allude to the angela's uh, fufu it's uh, one of the preferable food for me and if you read my book you'll see where i talked in length about the fufu and how it's eaten everywhere most of like the African countries and it's so good. And if even if you eat fufu and goat, you can't yeah. have anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can never go wrong. Something else I just thought to add now is you know, uh, in Nigeria, not just Nigeria, Ghana, um, Gambia, a lot of the African countries too do this jollof rice. Yes, jollof. Mm -hmm. And it's burnt. You don't want to, like, you will see people fighting for the bond part of the jollof rice because that is usually the sweetest part. <laughs> so growing up, <laughs> growing up, my mom would kind of use it to, like, trick us. You know, she will scoop up the, the top. Of course, she knows we are waiting for her to dive into the pot. So her own it will be, you know, whoever takes the last scoop gets to wash the pots. <laughs> <laughs> And then you're there 30 minutes later, exactly. still scrubbing out the bowl. Yeah. Maybe because oh. <laughs> then we get in, we get carried away when nobody wants to, you know, miss out on any part of it. So it's like two, three people. No, I was the last. No, I, you know, she's like, just make sure the pot is washed. Period. So, <laughs> one spot right? of jollof rice is always, it's always a huge treat. Um. Those are all wonderful memories. Thank you so much. I uh, want to just move a little bit towards the conversation that um, about sort of around Evangeline, which is if you know the poem or not, the it's the Longfellow poem um, about Evangeline, who's an Acadian hero. It's about a story about a woman who it's a very romantic vision of a woman who loses her home and goes on a journey to find her true love. But what I was struck by was an essay I read this week in Amjambo, Africa, and I meant to ask you um, about the gentleman who wrote it, but it's, I want to read a quote, and I thought maybe we could sort of talk about it a little bit, which is, the quote is this, when immigrants arrive, we hope that our host country will accept us and facilitate our integration. We are deprived of everything. <clears throat> I'll leave it there. Um, because I just wondered, I was reading about why people settle in Maine, and it got me thinking about what it's like, and I haven't experienced it, you know, so I can't directly speak to it. And I, I just wondered what it's like to, um, what drew you to Maine? Was it safety? Was it jobs? Do you love pine trees? You know, um, what was it that drew you to Maine? Or was it just like, this has, place has, like part of it was I wondered, oh, is it work? You know, because I know like that's when, when my family came to this country long ago, they settled in Virginia, but went to Missouri because there was work. Um, 
So I can go first. And <laughs> so I came here in the U.S. in 2002 and landed first in uh, Richmond, Virginia. And <laughs> then there were really, really few people from uh, from uh, Congo or Rwanda and Burundi, and I felt so lonely, and I couldn't, you know, stand it was just loneliness. And I heard that there were some people from uh, from Congo here in Portland. And, and and then I just say, okay, I don't want to be alone here. I've got to go somewhere where I can find at least a few friends because I couldn't speak English then. So that's how I landed here. But when I came, uh, it was in summer. I remember vividly the day it was in uh, June 19, 2002. And it was hot and it was beautiful. And I say, wow, this is a beautiful place. And since then, I've stayed and I, I don't think I'm going to go anywhere <laughs> soon. But I love, of course, after getting to know the whole uh, uh, life here in Maine, I really enjoyed the safety and I enjoyed the friendship that I've made. And it's a very good thing. And I'm glad I'm here. Yeah, me too. Anyone so, else? Um, I, I came to straight to Bangor because um, my husband got a job. I always try to appreciate the fact that I came to Bangor not running for my life, but you know, in search of greener pastures. And that differentiates me from you know asylum seekers and refugees. And I'm grateful for that. So coming to Maine, it was pretty much a choice uh, because you know, shortage of um, medical professionals, my husband was recruited, and you know, we are given a couple of choices. But we, we chose Maine because you know how you look when you're not in the United States, you look at the map, you know, it's a tiny map. You see Maine here, you see just beside it, New York. I mean, everybody knows and loves New York. And we're like, oh, we can get in and get out of New York. Mm -hmm. Only for us to en enter here and realize, you know, New York and Maine is a world apart. So that was what brought us here. But when we first came, you know, only my husband could walk. I couldn't because of our our class of visa. So it was very challenging, especially someone like me who doesn't like to be idle, especially, you know, when I am forced to not do anything is different if I chose not to, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, so it was really difficult and it was very lonely. It was very challenging because uh, my husband then, you know, working um, for right aid then, you know, he, pharmacist, they work 12 hours. He would be sent to Guilford, you will be sent to so many places. And we didn't have quite choices like that because you're here on a contract. So, you know, it made my life really, really very difficult because I was all by myself. There was nobody and I couldn't even, I could hardly find anybody that was not white. I was still struggling with my accent that was very thick and, you know, a lot of things. It was a huge, huge struggle. Like, I remember anytime I saw anybody that looked like black, it was like, oh my goodness, that's Santa Claus for me. Like, you know, uh, you know, so it was, it was a huge, a huge challenge when I first came. But over time, I started to um, kind of enjoy and like the safety and the slow pace of things. There was a time I went to Boston, you know, it was the first time I, I went for, um, I do immigration law, I went uh you know, with respect to a client to uh, the immigration court in Boston. I remember driving round and round and round and round looking for parking. It was like, oh my goodness, you know, in Bengal, for less than five minutes, I've left my house less than five minutes and wherever I'm going to, and I'm not struggling to find parking. Finally, I was able to find parking at the eighth floor of the parking lot. And then I went and pressed the escalate, uh, es um, the elevator, it was spoiled. And I was wearing these heels, you know, like all dressed up and, you know. So, of course, coming down the stairs, it was easier for me to rush to the courthouse and do everything I needed to do. But when it was time to go back, of course, the elevator was still not working. So you needed to have imagined me climbing staircase to the eighth floor on high heels on a, under a very hot sun with my toes burning like crazy. And then I paid over 80 something dollars for parking space. Well, that's Boston for you. I love my man. Like, I love my man. <laughs> I saw you shaking your head, Natalie. Like, oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm like, oh, my goodness. I love my man. And more importantly, I love, love my Bengal. Portland is beginning to get like that, too. Driving up and down and around and it's around, busy. you know. Yes. And then over time, you know, 
once you're on the news, you're hearing a lot of um, terrible stories. I'm not saying things don't happen here, but sure. you know, the, the relatively, those stories are very less. Yeah. That doesn't mean things don't happen here, like I said, but comparatively, it is very less. And, you know, I love the communal sense here that, you know, pretty much everybody knows everybody. It right. kind of gives some sense of not just sense of belonging, but sense of um, kind of ownership, you know, that you're known, you know, you know the next person, and it kind of comes with some sense of security, too, because right. um, there right. is some we are taught growing up that you know when people know you and know where you're coming from most times they have more regard for you versus people who don't know you or know where you're coming from you know so it comes with it some form of um security and i mean we've come a long way it's been a lot of struggles but you know like i said nowhere is perfect you know and i love how things have become and where we are right now yeah natalie why did you pick maine so um <laughs> when I graduated college in France, um, I was uh, at the University of Angers in Western France. I was um, offered the opportunity to come teach in Maine um, by uh, professors from the University of Maine system that came to my university and they were looking for some, for some recent graduates to go teach in Maine for one year. And uh, yes, you can see where it's going with that. <laughs> so, um, I, um, I was offered the choice of either going to teach at the Uni University of Maine at Farmington as a teaching assistant or to go to the University of Maine at Machayas mm. as a French lecturer because they had never had any French before um, in their program. They had Spanish. And yes. <laughs> and um, so I was given the choice and I decided to go to Machayas because um, I wanted to be on the coast. That was one reason. I wanted to be by the water. And, and I liked the idea of starting my own program because I had a little experience teaching before. Hmm. And at the Alliance Francaise actually uh, in Limerick, Ireland when I was there doing my masters. And um, so there I am, I decided to go to uh, Machayas, Maine for one year to teach. And like Angela said, I looked on the map of the United States. Of course I did not, <laughs> I did not know anything about Maine because French people usually know, you know, New York and um, Washington DC, maybe Florida, California, maybe Boston. Uh, so I, you know, I found Maine on a map and I, you know, where I was going to go. And of course I thought, oh, I'll go to Boston every weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like Angela with New York, you know. And uh, so I came to Maine to teach uh, at the college there at Machayas. And um, it was a great experience. People were lovely. They were so happy, so grateful to have this French young woman come teach French at the university. And um, the, the welcoming and the reception that I had was just, I always remember that. I always remember the flowers and the fruits waiting for me in my room and, and how people were so, so happy of me coming to teach French. And um, I started the French program there. They had never had any French and then I built it. As the year went on, you know, we had a lot of, of interest into the program. And um, I was invited to stay if I wanted to stay longer. I also <laughs> met my husband, I have to say. There's, there's, a, there's a love story there. Met my husband, uh, who also became a teacher, was, was studying to be a teacher. And um, we decided to stay. Uh, we got married and stayed in the uh, Machayas area for five years. I kept teaching at the college. They had me teaching uh, still after uh, I had a baby. And they, they, they really were good to me about keeping me teaching at night to, you know, to work with my schedule and everything. Mm -hmm. And we moved to Bangor. Um, because my husband went for his master's there at UMO and uh, I worked at Bangor International Airport <laughs> because of my languages, you know, they were, mm -hmm. I was helping with any international travelers that would be coming in transit. Usually they would be coming in transit, but they would not come out actually um, in Maine. Right. And, and um, then I decided I wanted to, you know, go back and, and teach again and, um, I could not teach at the college level anymore because I did not have a PhD. That became, that became a thing after a while, even though 
I did teach part-time at UMA for seven years also uh, when we moved to mid-course, but then the University of Maine system decided or said, you know, you had to have a PhD to teach, even if you were teaching as a lecturer, as an adjunct lecturer. So I wanted to keep teaching because that's what I love to do. And I became certified to teach um, K to 12, you know, in main schools. Right. And so that's what I ended up doing, hmm. how, mostly how high school. You, how did you get, I want to fast forward just a little bit because we're getting short on yeah. time. How yes. did you get connected? How did you and George get connected? Can you tell me either of yes. you, how does that happen? I I met uh, uh, George um, is a, the publisher of the newspaper, but also Kit Harrison. Yes. And she was a French teacher before being a full time uh, newspaper publisher and journalist and, and writer. And we met through, you know, teaching connections. Huh. And um, and then she found out about my um, my um, experience also, because another part of the story is that I grew up in Côte d'Ivoire. Right. I was born in Côte d'Ivoire because my father was there as a also a teacher. And so I grew up in Côte d'Ivoire until uh, when I was 11. So yeah. French speaking, Africa is part of me also. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. That's amazing. It's amazing to me that you both settled here. You know what I mean? It's just interesting how the world works sometimes yeah. um, to bring people together. And I think the thing that I really wanted, to, those are all great answers. Thank you, everybody. I, I think a thing that I would want to ask and George, maybe you can start because it's in Amjambo. I read about it a lot. And meaning you address this idea. And, um, you know, we're all striving for equity and diversity. But the biggest part that I think the hardest part is the inclusion part, the belonging. How do we build a sense of belonging? What are people doing to create a sense of belonging here in Maine for new Mainers? What do you think, George? Uh, I think the first step or the first step of the process is just to see the other person who doesn't look like you, yeah. like someone that can meet at the common ground, which is just, we're all human and we all uh, want the basic things, which is belonging, be loved, loving, and all those things. So without seeing one another, strangers, aliens, and all other names that you can hear, you know, that comes around and goes around. That's the first thing. The other thing I think is very important is just to uh, to be inquisitive as to why other people are here. Yeah. And yeah. once you get to hear their story, it will cool you down and sometimes it will humble you knowing that these are the people who've lost, you know, the most cherished the things they have in their lives, which is home that we're talking about here. And then they were forced to leave their homes and coming here and trying to rebuild their lives again. So when once we all see that happening, it will kind of gives it the common ground to start building a one common community that will, you know, will full of peace and love and and the prosperity that we all aspire to. I think that's the main thing is that people come here, people, you don't leave your home just because, you know, you leave yeah. it because you have to. You have to. I just think that's, it's heartbreaking, you know? And, and the other thing that I must say is that, uh, that unless you know, unless you've taken time and, and, and learn from the other people, mm -hmm. you will realize quickly that like it's, they, most of the people who are coming here from the immigrant population, they have lost, they, their countries are very, very rich countries. But like if my country, which is Congo, DRC Congo, is one of the richest country on earth. But sadly, people are leaving Congo and coming here in Maine and going to other countries just because they have no choice and they are forced to leave. So right. that's the poem of Angeline is about that, how the Acadians had to leave their homes. And even though Longfellow, not Acadian, not Catholic, an American, he somehow captured the spirit of that, um, that struggle. And Angela, I know you mentioned to me right before we started that you're on a commission that is uh, addressing uh, work, the workforce and uh, can you, I don't want to say, can you say what it is that you're doing? I don't want to say it for you. You tell me. It, thank you. It's the state workforce board. So there's a subcommittee for it, which is the immigrant um, workforce subcommittee. Cool. And uh, basically because most of the Myself, inclusive, I studied law in Nigeria, got admitted to practice law in Nigeria. 
Nigeria coming here. I was admitted in the state of New York, but up till today, I'm still not licensed in Maine. And it's just about technicalities, you know, uh, sending my transcript, they still want extra things that nobody even knows about. So uh, one of the major, um, major um, um, target of this uh, workforce is, you know, ways to uh, make it easier so that foreign trained graduates can be, their skills and talents can be utilized in this state because you find a lot of uh, internationally trained uh, professionals who come here, like myself, who, I, you know, like uh, I know there's a judge from a country who basically is doing many jobs. Myself as a licensed and I worked in the dish room, washing dishes before I was able to strike out on my own. And this is not the best use of these talents and skills and knowledge. So this is basically finding ways to loosen policies on licensing so that foreign trained professionals can come here and be able to find a good pathway or easier pathway to be able to get licensed in Maine so that those skills and knowledges will be um, better utilized in our states. Yeah, I mean, isn't that, that's like the future of Maine, you know, is to, um, Maine is a state that needs young people. I'm just gonna like, I'll put it bluntly, you know? And I think that's, um, it's that, uh, you know, it's Hamilton immigrants get stuff done. And I just think that that is, we need to embrace definitely all of our meanings. Um, Natalie, I had a quote from you that I wanted to read that I, that really, I loved it. I thought it really, it summed up why people should learn another language and um, something that um, as American, I'm embarrassed. I don't really, I speak smatterings of other languages, but anyway, it's not about me. Uh, you said, Natalie, I am passionate about teaching. I am passionate about teaching about the Francophone world, opening students' minds to other lands and cultures. This is what is great about teaching a language. You also get to teach geography, history, art, literature, music, literature, and cooking. And I just thought that struck me that that's also part of what's so awesome is that people bring their culture with them when they come. It's something we carry with us all the time. And so, I just thought that was so, it's, it's interesting to me, Nat, Natalie, that you moved here, you started a French program, and in doing so, you brought all these people out of their worlds and into another world. I mean, crossing them. Is that a fair yes. thing to say? Yeah, yeah, within the classroom, but also by, you know, when, once upon a time when we could still travel, <laughs> uh, by <laughs> taking nice. them, you know, by taking students to Quebec, for example, or taking them to France. I've taken students to France several times. Um, but yes, as, a, as an educator, as a French teacher, um, I love teaching my subject because it gives me the excuse to not only teach French, the language, and, and, and of course teach about France, which is what I started doing when I first came. And when I, when I first started being a French teacher, I was teaching mostly about France, but I don't do that anymore. I teach about Africa and all the places in the world that speak French. And as a French teacher, it's my excuse to teach uh, American students about other cultures, world cultures, but also geography, yep. because they, they need to learn about geography. Uh, I'm doing a big African unit right now with my seniors um, at my school. And, and I mean, they're learning so much about, I'm using the French speaking African countries. As you said, there's more than 20 countries and through that, we're studying um, uh, the, the, the food. Um, the, um, we're doing a lot of stories of tales, um, um, you know, folk tales and um, stories from the countries. We're doing um, uh, art. Uh, we're doing literature. We've done from Senegal. We've done some writers from Senegal. Now we're actually doing the DRC, the, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I do that with every lesson that I teach. I, you know, I show how it is done in French speaking Africa or how it is done in Quebec or in the mm -hmm. Caribbean islands of France, right. uh, in Southeast Asia, which has a French uh, heritage. And it's just so important to do that with students. Yeah, absolutely. Angela or George, you have anything to add to that at all? Don't have to. I just want to add, and I bring in the newspaper also in my classes. Yes. And we're, we're doing that. We're getting more and more teachers, French teachers, to use Enjambo Africa in their classes, in their French classes, because 
articles are in French and in English, so I can use that, uh, use passages and have the students read, read and interpret, or like what, what I'm doing now, teaching about African countries. Um, and also, um, I'm trying to invite, now with COVID, it's difficult, but I would like to invite some of the African immigrants in Maine to come talk to my students. So I'm trying to get that going with some Zoom uh, talks, you know. Um, I wanted to add something that Angela, uh, to what Angela said about um, um, African immigrants coming in and having degrees and how it's so difficult for them to get their degrees um, recognize here and that is a big problem like for example we need french teachers in maine really badly and so we would you know that would be wonderful if we could get some of those african speakers french speakers to become teachers um i went through that myself as a french uh, citizen who studied in france i had all my transcripts in french and when i went to get certified to teach french with the department of education in maine they did not make it easy for me they told me I had to have all my transcripts translated, high school and college. They wanted to make sure that I had the equivalent of an American bachelor's. I had a French master's. And so I started, naively, I started translating them myself. And I was, I was told, no, 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 you cannot do that. And they recommended a Boston um, educational com company that does that, that does, you know, translations like that. That was very expensive, but that was on me. I mean, and I had to take more classes. Yeah. Um, anyway, it just wasn't easy. So I can imagine, you know, I can imagine how difficult it must be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah talking about uh, difficulty for me, I feel because I've gotten in arguments whereby people are like, oh, so you want to have an easy pass? No, that is not what we are no. asking for. Like my own situation is, I sent in my transcript. I was told to get a detailed explanation of all the courses I did for the six years of law study. And no school gives that. My school at some point was okay, we don't understand what this is in addition to a transcript, but if the board will reach out to us and correspond officially, we could find a way to work on it. But the main board of bar examiners wouldn't do that. Then I, came, I got licensed in New York and I been in active practice of immigration, which is federal law. And the rule is after three years of active practice, you can apply to be admitted on motion, you know, having been licensed in the country. I did that. And as of 2019, I applied again, having been in active practice of immigration law, still, they still treated me as if I had have never been licensed in the state of Maine. They treated me like a fresh graduate just because I studied abroad. You know, so um, I wanted to make it clear that nobody is expecting a free pass. Right. But what we are asking is, you know, make it have a, a clear path. You know, one of the basics is for me still, I'm, I'm using myself because I know my story inside out, uh, is that if you if you study law in a country that um, the, the legal system is based in English common law, that is the basis. So um, when I took the bar exam, I was months old here. And I took New York by exam, which is arguably the most difficult in the country. And I passed this within months of arrival. And in my first sitting, what does that tell you? Not just that um, I'm not at least that like a lot of people think when you come from Africa, you don't know, they don't teach you well there, you know. And secondly, that there's a lot of similarities because no matter how smart I am, I couldn't have been able to study and learn something that people go to law school for how many years to study within months. So that tells you there's a lot of similarities at least to start from, you know. So despite all those things, you would think that, I mean, I know people that I met preparing for the exam who studied here still, they didn't pass it in one sitting. But here, this African lady from the African Sahara, you know, coming and passing it. So it tells you a lot. But, you know, being able to have a way, a working way, for example, making it that the main board of exam examiners, if they want these things outside of a transcript, you should communicate with those schools directly because they kept me in limbo, you know, sending me back and forth. And so yeah, just to make that clear that no immigrant is looking for a free pass. We want a straight cut way. You know, this is what to expect. This is what you need to do. And if you do this and do that, this will happen. Instead of, oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. 
don't know. Oh, you, you know, that right. it's, 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 uh, I just wanted to make that clear. Yes. Uh, and mm-hmm. also in Bangor, one of the things I was strong, sorry, am I? Oh, we, yeah. You're breaking up a little bit. You're breaking up just a little bit. Yeah. So for, for me in Bangor, I, you know, we've been having a lot of conversations. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. A lot of conversations, a lot of actions being taken. Is that enough yet? Of course not. But, you know, I, there's this saying in Nigeria that when you, when you beat a child with one hand, you use the other hand to pull that child back and pet the child on the back, you know? So when I like what size for things not being done i like to also acknowledge when baby steps and bengal we've been myself and one of my friends like we've been having a lot of conversation city on how to deal with students you know how to understand the differences in cultures and how to understand that even though most of those people are from africa but even africa nigeria and ghana they are neighboring countries but how different they can be and right. being able to understand you know those cultures how we can make a huge difference in how you treat and react with students and how you understand why certain students behave certain ways and you know the city of bengal too has been you know been able and willingly taking a lot of babies so i like to commend that but at the same time you know it's there is always room for improvement so i'm yeah always right. hopeful and looking forward to this improvement Yes, yes, yes. George, you look like you had something you wanted to add. And then I have one last question. Did you have something you wanted to add? I just want to say that so for, for Angela, who's coming from the English-speaking country, it's probably much easier for her because you already all you need to work on is just your accent. But imagine somebody who's coming, transitioning from a fully French-speaking country and coming here in the U.S. And whatever you may have as a cred- you know, credentials, you just create, you know, you put into more scrutiny than, than the other person. But one thing that I want you to make sure that just like the other thing that will easily, uh, the ease the process of integration is uh, uh, taking out the myth that we may have about certain people or certain, you know, countries. Like when you come here, they think well, Africa is one country. They think it's, you know, people are from there, not educated. All those things, it's just like a myth and they have to be cleared by knowledge. And that's what we do better at the Jumbo Africa. I'm trying to make sure that, you know, he, here's the doctors from Congo and from Rwanda, from Nigeria, from, and they, they've done a lot of work into getting where they are. And you can't just toss them their time and the years of studying away and thinking that they have to start from scratch. So yeah, I think that's a, a great, um, that's a great round of what you just said. And I also think I read a sentence that said, you know, imagine the courage that it takes to um, try to communicate in a language that isn't your mother tongue. And it's just so true that the courage, it's truly courage, you know? I mean, it's like putting your heart out and, and hoping that people will um, accept you, I think, you know? Yeah. I, I like that. I think I was talking to a friend of mine and and he said that, look, you don't laugh at somebody who's not speaking good English because they probably speak another another language better than you do. So it's, a, it's a, and I was talking today, I had a conversation with a student at NYU and, and I was just telling them, look, and then we've now become a small a village. We all connected somewhere and we got to learn from one another. And, and I'm glad that Natalie is talking about teaching the student here in Maine about, you know, Nigeria, Togo and you know uh, you know Rwanda and Congo. I think that bringing like opening them to a broader world that is just beyond our own boundaries of Maine and Hampshire and here in the United States. So it's, it's a good thing that we should expose people to a bigger village that we belong to. Now. Yeah, I think that people don't realize that like the border that borders are things that we've made up, and that so, also that there's multitudes are contained just next door to you, maybe. Yes. You know, if you just open your eyes and walk, walk, I don't know, go outside <laughs> when it's safe. Um, I have a question from the um, audience, and that is, this will be our last question, and each of you can have a chance to answer it. So is, what is a word or small piece of advice that you would tell yourself when you first arrived with Maine? So if you could go back 
What is something you would tell yourself when you first arrived? Who wants to go first? Raise your hand. Yes. <laughs> I, I can go. Okay, great. So the, 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 I mean, the advice that I'll give myself when I came here is just like be open and learn more right at the get-go. So when you arrive here as a new person, first of all, depending where you're coming from, that the first state that you go into is the denial, denying the fact that you are now in a new world where you have a completely new system that you have to face, and you don't realize that you are here to stay. Pro, you know, I don't, and you got to learn the system here and speak the language. So I spent years of denying and running away from people who could teach me English until I realized that hey, I'm here to stay, and I need to face challenge of learning English and at the minute I start realize I had that awareness it was like opening up to a new world. Wow. Good. Angela? Yeah. Yeah I think I agree with George a, li a little bit you know it was me too I, I lived a lot in self-denial you know I think one advice I would give myself because I look back now and I'm like all those years I I, I, I would say I wasted you know trying to fit in the box Mm -hmm. of you know the expectation find the regular white collar jobs and all that i i kind of look back sometimes i'm like why did i do that you know why didn't i create my own space all along so mm -hmm. one advice i would give myself would be don't live in self-denial tell yourself the truth know what you want and go for it don't try to be, allow the society to be boxed you into you know uh, what truly is not you Oof. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Okay. Yes, exactly. Natalie, how about you? Um, I would say a, a little bit what George said, you know, be open to be open and curious to learn about the other people that you're, you know, the community where you're arriving. And that goes a long way if you're showing that you're interested and, and uh, you're open to knowing about them and then they want to know about you. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like reciprocal. And also be open to change. I mean, there are things that I, that I experienced the first year I was in Maine that were, you know, not that easy. For example, I had never seen snow. Okay, so that was, you know, down East Maine. And um, when my future husband told me you had to not wear those shoes, you should not wear those shoes, you should wear those boots, those L.L. Bean boots. And I refused. I said, no, that's not going to match my skirt. I am not wearing those boots. I am not wearing that. And then I learned, you know, uh, the difficult way by, you know, falling in the snow or whatever happened. And so little by little, I had to kind of like get out of my French, whatever, you know, shell and, um, and, um, and, and fit in the, you know, main, whatever, mold a little bit. But I've also, and that's something else that's important is, also stay true to who you are. And I, I've been here now for 30 years and I am, I think I'm still very, very French. I read French books. I watch French movies. I cook a lot of French food. I, I watch the French news every night. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's in me, it hasn't changed. I try to go to France once a year. I still have my father and my sister there. Um, so even though I'm very, you know, I'm considering myself, you know, very, well, you know, settled here, of course, after 30 years, yeah. I'm still very, I have a very strong French identity still. And that's important to keep that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, thank you so much, all three of you, Angela, George, and Natalie. What a wonderful conversation. Thank you for joining me and Ira. And um, merci. De rien. <laughs> Yes, uh, I'll just let everyone know, like I said, uh, Je ne suis pas Evangeline opened today. It runs through May 9th. You can go to our website, penobscottheater.org to get tickets. Please check out Amjambo Africa. Uh, look up Angela uh, Okafor. You can see all the wonderful work that she's doing in Bangor. And also, uh, please look up Natalie and read about the honor she just received. Read about all of these people and go, you know what? Go get go get to know your neighbor. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Merci.